Top 10 Weird World War 2 Tanks Part 2 Today we're going to continue on from the last video, Top 10 Weird World War 2 Tanks Part 1. Go watch that if you want, links are down below. Same rules as last time, no mock-up tanks or blueprint tanks. Only tanks that were actually built will be discussed in the video. So stick around for the next 5 tanks on the list and the bonus tank, let's get started. Number 5, The Archer. At first glance, the Archer doesn't appear any more abnormal than the average tank. It's a British tank with a 17 pounder anti-tank gun, fixed facing forward. The gun has 11 degrees traverse left and right. What makes this tank weird is that the main gun is facing the wrong way. I lied earlier, the main gun isn't facing forward, it's facing backwards. If the tank is facing towards the enemy, the 17 pounder gun will be facing 180 degrees away from them. I think this is the bit where I make a joke about it being a French tank design, due to it having the ability to retreat faster than it can attack. Jokes aside, there is a good reason for this design. Heavy German tanks, such as the Tiger and the Panther, were proving to be rather bothersome due to their thicker armour than their early war counterparts. British anti-tank guns were having trouble dealing with the new German tanks. It was decided to motorise the existing and reliable 17 pounder anti-tank gun. The base of the Valentine tank was chosen to be part of this new tank destroyer as it was already in production, cheap and reliable. The low profile of the Valentine was ideal for a tank destroyer as it is a smaller target and therefore harder to hit by the enemy. The gun was mounted rearwards facing so that the tank design of the Valentine wouldn't have to be altered too much. Changing the design of a tank drastically would slow down production. The rear facing gun made the Archer ideal for ambushing as it could fall back after firing a few rounds. It could get away at top speed using gears that are normally for going forward. The rear mounted gun may have also been a solution for getting around the British tanks notoriously slow reverse speeds at that time in the war, with average speeds of 4km an hour across British tanks at the time. The longer production cycle of the tank from design to manufacture led to it being produced later than intended. When production was in full swing there were much better tanks with 17 pounder guns being produced such as the Sherman Firefly. The Firefly had more benefits than the Archer, such as a closed fighting compartment and thicker armour. There were also American M10s with 17 pounder guns, which were called Achilles. These offered more mobility than the Archer as well as more crew protection. 655 Archers were made. Some are on display in museums around the world, such as the Bovington Tank Museum in England. Number 4, the Mouse. Where to start on talking about this beast of a tank? The Mouse or Panzer Kampfwagen 8? is a tank that had some of the thickest armour ever used in tank warfare, weighing in at an impressive 188 tonnes. The front armour being 220mm thick, which was sloped for increased effectiveness, giving an effective thickness of over 300mm. To put the thickness in perspective, the American Sherman had 50mm of frontal armour, which was sloped to give an increased effectiveness of 50 to 90mm thick. The Mouse's gun packed a massive punch with a 128mm cannon based off a naval gun design. There was also a Coraxel gun. Coraxel is a smaller gun mounted next to the main gun in the tank. Normally Coraxel guns are not noteworthy, as on most tanks they are machine guns which are used to engage infantry. In the Mouse's case, the Coraxel is a 75mm gun, which is the same type used in the Panzer III, Panzer IV and Stugs. Oh, and there also is a standard MG34 that was mounted next to the main gun as well. So that's two Coraxel guns. Due to the weight being so massive, it couldn't cross bridges. German Porsche engineers working on the tank came up with a solution for this problem. Instead of crossing over bridges, the mouse will fjord the rivers instead. It could even go under the water level if necessary, up to a depth of 8 meters. The mouse was to utilise a snorkel for air for the crew and its unique engines to cross the rivers. The engines are unique because there's two of them. One is a diesel engine, which was used to provide electricity for an electric motor that drove the tank. The hybrid vehicle drivetrain was a new concept in development at the time period. Using this system for a tank was something Porsche was trying to utilise. When a mouse wanted to cross a river, it would have to do it in pairs with another mouse. The mouse that wanted to cross would turn off its diesel electric generator. The two Panzer 8s would then connect with an electric cable between them. The second mouse would provide electricity with its generator while the first mouse crossed the river. Once the first mouse had crossed, it would provide electricity for the second mouse to cross. This method of crossing rivers isn't exactly optimal but it was compromised. The problem with the mouse is just because a tank is big doesn't mean it's better. 
Hitler had a love for big things that were showboaty, such as the Schwer Gustav railway gun and the Keroman submarine base in France. It can be argued that both of these projects were oversized and unnecessary for the tasks they were built to do. There are many downsides for this tank. Gas guzzler. You may think your car has bad fuel economy. Well, the mouse does around 400 meters for one liter of fuel, and that's on road. Off road, it goes down to around 150 meters per one liter. Germany's fuel situation in the late stages of the war was dire. Resources involved. With a metal that was used to make a single mouse, three Tigers and a Panzer IV could have been made. Metal was a rare resource for late war Germany. Massive target. Allied planes which were controlling the skies could have made easy work of the mouse. The mouse even with its impressive armour would not be able to stand up to multiple attacks by allied close support bombers. Even if the mouse got into combat it wouldn't have done much to halt the allies advance. Fun fact, the mouse happens to be one of the only tanks in history to have production stopped completely by bombing, as the only factory that was able to make it was bombed. Two mouses, wait or is it two mice? Two Panzer Kampfwagen 8s were made but both of them were destroyed by the Germans to prevent them getting into enemy hands. The Russians reassembled the mouse by using the hull of the first mouse that was made and the turret of the second mouse that was made. The complete mouse is now in display at the Kubanka Tank Museum in Russia. Fun little fact, the hammer and sickle that you see on the side of the tank was put there by the Germans, not the Russians. The idea behind this was that if the Allies saw this tank when doing aerial photographing, they might have thought it was a captured Russian tank rather than a new experimental German tank. Number 3, the Schofield tank. New Zealand had an odd taste for tanks in World War II, with one of the other tanks that they made which could easily have made its way onto this list being the Bob Semple. The Bob Semple was a tank made with locally resourced parts built onto a tractor. Back to the Schofield. The Schofield was a free crew tank with a two pounder gun. It had very light armour which was just about able to stop rifle bullets. New Zealand was unable to secure a steady supply of armoured vehicles for its army, so it was decided to get local contractors involved. New Zealand was fighting in the Pacific theatre, so ideally tanks would be light and mobile. Mobility and speed was something that all army generals no matter what country wanted for their tanks, which is where the hybrid wheel and tracked concept comes in. Wheels can be used when road conditions are good, allowing high speed travel. With the wheels down, the Schofield could reach speeds of up to 74 to 80 kilometers an hour. When driving conditions were bad, the wheels could be lifted up and the tank could drive on its treads, which still had an impressive speed of 40 to 43 kilometers an hour. New Zealand wasn't the first country to do this. Other countries had been experimenting with the idea of hybrid tracked and wheeled vehicles. Sweden had been working on a similar tanks long before New Zealand was working on the Schofield. There was a tank called the Stritzelwagen L5 which employed the same hybrid track and road wheel system. The L5 was very bad and I quote, The model was so weak, the motor drive system was brittle, the gun turret needed to be removed for it to run off road. To be fair though, this tank was from around the 1930s. Another Swedish tank that was built much closer to 1940 has a strong resemblance with the Schofield. It was the Stritzelwagen FM31. Benefits of hybrid systems are, using tracks over a long period of time can put large strain on the transmission and the mechanics of the vehicle. This shortens the lifetime of the vehicle. By using wheels we can potentially extend the lifetime of the vehicle. Logistics. Due to tanks having to be transported over long distances by train or by riding on a truck, time and money has to be spent transporting conventional tanks over long distances. Using wheels could solve this problem. A downside to hybrid systems is that they can be costly to build. It could be argued that the wheels may not give much of an advantage for the increased cost per unit of the tank. Number 2. The Talc Panzer Also known as the Underwassen Panzer which translates into English as underwater tank or diving tank. The Talc Panzer is a modification of existing German Panzer III's and Panzer IV's to make them completely watertight. This allows them to travel underwater to depths of around 15 meters. The reason for this modification was for Operation Sea Line, which was the proposed invasion plan for England by Germany. To make the Panzers watertight, vision ports, hatches and air intakes would be sealed with tape. Big gaps such as the turret and hull would be sealed with an inflatable hose. The gun mantlet, commander cupola and bow machine gun port were fitted with special rubber covers. 
These covers and seals could be blown off with an explosive cable. This would enable the tank to become quickly combat ready. Air for the crew and engines would be drawn in through a hose. This hose was attached to a float, which kept the air intake above the water level. On the float, there was a radio antenna to provide communication between the tanks and the transport barges. Modifications were also made to the insides of the tank, such as the engine was converted to be cooled with seawater, exhaust pipes from the engine were fitted with one-way valves, an internal pump was fitted to remove water that would seep in. Navigation underwater would be impossible with vision. It would have to be done with a directional gyro compass or by instructions from the transport barges. For the invasion, the tanks would be deployed from barges near the English coast. They would then drive along the ocean floor to the beaches. This plan sounds simple, but there are so many places that this plan can also fail. Which may be why the Allies focused on getting their tanks to float, with tanks such as the DD tank. You may think DD stands for D-Day tank, but it actually stands for Duplex Drive. This variant of the Sherman is designed to float, and includes modifications such as waterproofing, a screen and a propeller. These tanks were used for the D-Day landings and other operations such as crossing of the Rhine. The Germans also had some tanks that could float. These tanks were called the Schwimmpanzer. They were a simple conversion of Panzer II's and other early war German tanks. A boat frame would be placed on the tank and then secured. The Schwimmpanzer was not built in large numbers. Back to the Tauchpanzer now. There were quite a few downsides with the Tauchpanzer, such as time of operation. Tanks could only operate for short periods of time underwater, up to around 20 minutes. Getting stuck. The tanks were at risk of sinking into the soft sand and silt of the seabed. This chance increased if the tank stopped moving. It may not also be possible to keep moving forward. Obstacles such as rocks or natural sea trenches couldn't be spotted as the vehicle was navigating blind. Logistics. The tanks had to be deployed near the shore, involving logistics of large barges that were capable of carrying these tanks, which all had to be custom made. These barges would be very vulnerable when offloading the tanks, as they had to be near the English coast. 75 Type B barges were ordered for Operation Sea Line. A total of 168 Panzer III's were converted into Tauk Panzers. Number 1. Vitog 2. Is this truly the weirdest tank of World War II? Not really. I think there are weirder tanks out there. It's the design philosophy behind the tank that makes me rather interested in it. It has a huge presence weighing 80 tons with 114mm thick frontal armour, which is very impressive for when it actually was designed. The turret chosen at the end of its development was one with a 17 pounder gun inside it. TOG is an acronym for the old gang. They were led by the secretary for the landship committee behind the design of World War I British tanks. The TOG 2 holds many World War I tank design features. Most of these features were irrelevant for World War II, which is why I don't think the tank took off. These features are holes for the sponsons on the side. These hatches on the sides were meant for adding additional tank guns onto the side of the tank. One on each side. Sponsons are an idea from World War I which did not carry over to World War II. No suspension. The first version of the TOG didn't have suspension. It was thought the tank wouldn't need it as it's crawling along with the infantry. Slow. The tank was designed to be slow, not that it could actually achieve faster speeds if it wanted. This is the same view though held with World War I tank designers as tanks main role was support the infantry. This drastically changed in World War II with tanks being designed for different roles. The TOG 2 had a top speed of 14 km an hour. Long. The TOG 2 was designed to be able to cross trenches. But trenches were a thing of the past now. With the Germans doing Blitzkrieg or, in English, lightning warfare, there was very little stagnant warfare anymore. Another reason that it's very long is because of the hybrid electric diesel motor just like the mouse. No other British tanks were made with this system during World War II, probably because it had a tendency to catch fire, as Porsche found that with his Tiger prototype. Only one TOG survives to this day, and it's currently in display at Borrington Tank Museum in England. Bonus tank, Karl Grint. The Karl was a self-propelled siege mortar produced by Germany weighing 124 tons. It fired 600mm shells that weighed 2,170 kilograms. It could smash through 450 millimeters of steel or three and a half meters of concrete. The car had a fire rate of one round every 10 minutes. With its light shells, it could reach fire ranges of around 10 kilometers. If the car was needed for an operation, a survey would have to be carried out in advance of where it was needed, 
and then the ground to be flattened out in preparation for it. It had a top speed of around 10 km an hour on level ground. The car was originally built for taking on France's Maginot Line. It wasn't ready in time. Not that it was actually needed as Germany bypassed the Maginot Line by going through Belgium. The Kaul is mostly known for its role in Sevastopol, which is in Russia, where three of them rain shells at the coastal defence battery. Too little quantifiable effect. The reason I say quantifiable is because the damage inflicted by these mortars was fairly negligible. One of the coastal defence guns was damaged but quickly repaired. What you can't measure is the morale of the men defending Sevastopol. The stress of the constant shelling from guns, firing shells of sizes never even seen before, these mortars weren't even the biggest gun in the German arsenal at Sevastopol. The Schwer Gustav was a railway gun that fired 800mm shells, weighing over 7 tons. That's three times more than the last shells we're talking about, and add a little more. It was able to destroy an ammunition bunker that was 27 meters underground. The Schwer Gustav easily deserves its own video. But back to the car for now. Logistics. A custom train car was used to take the cars over long distances. The car will be broken down and reassembled closer to the area where it was needed. Custom Panzer IVs were modified to be able to carry shells to help with the rearming process. A crane was also needed for the assisting the loading of the munitions. Seven cars were built, but only one remains on display. Funnily enough, I actually found out when making this video that the only car that currently exists is on display at the Kubenkek Tank Museum. Remember we were talking about that one earlier. But it gets better. It's sitting right next to the mouse in the museum. What are the odds that when I'm doing my research that it turns out two of the tanks, they could have been anywhere in the world and yet they're both parked next to each other in the same museum. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you want to know about other weird World War II things, I'd like to direct you to my video about wood-powered tanks during World War II. Links down below. Leave a comment if you want about what tanks you would have put on the list. Also, if you want, leave a like. Thanks for watching. Like, comment and subscribe or I'll break your f***ing legs.